Hallo und herzlich willkommen im Literaturhaus Berlin und danke, dass ihr und sie so lange gewartet habt. Wir hatten ja noch ganz aufregend einen Feueralarm hier. Alles in Ordnung, alles ist gesichert. Wir können uns jetzt voll auf die Veranstaltung konzentrieren. Mein Name ist Sonja Longulius und ich begrüße euch ganz herzlich hier im großen Saal und auch zu Hause im Livestream. Ähm, wir zeichnen die Veranstaltung auch auf, damit man sie sich später nochmal anschauen kann. Wir haben ein ganz spannendes Panel heute zusammengestellt, die ich äh, euch gleich vorstellen werde. Erstmal noch ein paar Worte dazu, warum wir das Ganze veranstalten. Das ist nämlich eine Veranstaltungsreihe im Rahmen von Flexploitation, einer begehbaren Installation, die man noch bis Dienstag, den 11. Oktober, unten bei uns im Kaminzimmer besichtigen kann, also heute natürlich auch. Geschaffen wurde die von Steffen Köhn und Johannes Büttner ähm, und basiert auf Snow Crash, äh, einem Roman von Neil Stevenson. Und ich empfehle Ihnen und allen, die sich noch anzuschauen, die ist nämlich noch nur noch bis Dienstag zu sehen. Und im Rahmen dieser Installation haben wir uns auch eine literarische Reihe überlegt, zu der wir AutorInnen und KünstlerInnen einladen und eingeladen haben schon, die über die äh, Flexploitation, also die Ausbeutung in der digitalen Arbeitswelt sprechen. Und heute geht es aber eher um das Do-it-yourself, das DIY ähm, im digitalen Arbeiten in der Kunst und auch in der Literatur. Und ich freue mich sehr, dieses diverse und schöne Panel hier zu haben. Wo fange ich an? Jan Berger wird beginnen mit einer Lecture-Performance. Neben ihm sitzt um, Penny uh, Rafferty. You will speak in English, right? So we will also have a mixture of German and English, which I think is very nice. Um, rechts von ihr sitzt Felix Kraus. Ich freue mich sehr. Er wird einen Roman vorstellen, den man noch nicht lesen kann, aber den ich unbedingt empfehle und ich hoffe, dass er sehr bald erscheinen wird. Mehr dazu gleich. Und das Ganze hält zusammen... Sarah Theurer, die eine Kuratorin ist und vielleicht auch ein wenig von ihrer Arbeit erzählen wird. Wir werden sehen. Jetzt soll es aber endlich losgehen. Ich wünsche Ihnen, euch allen und euch viel Spaß. Welcome. Danke, Sonja, für die um, einführenden Worte. Um, I'll switch to English, if this is okay. So we all share the same uh, language and only the reading will be in German. Um, Yeah, my name is Sarah, and um, I'm, um, I'm happy to be speaking today with uh, all of you, Jan, Penny, and, and Felix. And I want to thank um, Steffen and Johannes for initiating this conversation. Um, and um, yeah, also, of course, to Sonia Longilius and the whole team of Literaturhaus for hosting it. Um, interestingly, you mentioned the title, uh, the DIY Technopolitics. Um, Actually, um, all of the speakers here, Jan Berger is representing the Mythical Institute, Penny Rafferty is amongst others representing uh, the Black Swan uh, Collective or project, um, and Felix Krauss um, is representing the Swan Collective. First so maybe time. it's not so much uh, do it yourself, but um, we'll probably speak about this um, later, I hope. And. Um, We're also speaking about digital technologies, and so I wanted to start with, let's say, um, an assumption that um, so-called virtual worlds are always enmeshed with um, the physical worlds. Um, so they're not really um, to be separated easily, and we will also um, hear about this from Jan, um, I suppose, but um, in all the works, um, all the artistic practices are somehow dealing with this translation moment or the enmeshment moment. Um, Virtual worlds can be digital spaces like the metaverse, but can also be collective imaginaries. Um, and this is something we will be talking about as well. Um, what I think is important to note um, is that art practices are always somehow situated knowledges and um, very much uh, bound in material uh, discourses and material work. Um, so we shouldn't forget, um, even if we move into the digital realm, we shouldn't forget or shouldn't leave the physical space um, unguarded. <laughs> um, with this, uh, yeah, we will um, introduce um, the different practices um, of our speakers today. Um, and I think they're very different. Um, what might be interesting as like a common ground uh, to know, to start with, is that technology appears as an environment in which the work um, develops. Perhaps it's even like a, a natural habitat um, to 
the projects. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, all of the projects um, that you will introduce reflect on issues related to technology that are relevant um, also outside of the arts, let's say labor or governance. Um, and you all use technology as perhaps as a tool, but maybe also as something else um, to explore alternatives to um, current distributions of power. And um, as the video of Johannes and Stefan um, also shows, technology is often based or organized around a very hierarchical and, and centralized structures. And so the question, the main question that we're um, trying to approach um, today might be which technologies um, can be a paradigm for building a more symbiotic or non-exploitative relationship um, between humans, but also maybe with the planet. Um, while Jan is invested in online gaming spaces, uh, Black Swan um, works with or through the blockchain, um, and specifically in the form of decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, and Felix uh, researches artificial intelligence um, and speculates on interactive um, or in, in interaction between different kinds of um, neural networks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you're here as Swan Collective, um, and Swan Collective embodies five different alter egos that uh, each work in different genres or mm -hmm. <laughs> techniques. Um, but today we're here with the literature Swan. Yes, yes, <laughs> <laughs> only one today. <laughs> um, and you will be reading from uh, your third book uh, called Lexi X. Um, and, but also we should mention that you're working in VR and AR um, in different uh, collaborative practices and one of your works is currently shown at the Lyon Biennial um, and we might also speak about this later, yeah, I yeah. hope. <laughs> uh, Penny is a visual uh, theorist and member of Black Swan, as we said it's a Berlin-based um, Collective, and she's also the co-editor of a wonderful book uh, titled Radical Friends, which has just been recently published. Um, she co-edited with uh, Ruth Catlow, um, who was, I think, also in, involved in Black Swan in some way. Um, Black Swan is an organization experimenting with ways of giving artists control over funding, value, and decision-making. So there's this idea through the blockchain to establish um, less decentralized or horizontal approaches to um, traditional forms of art making. Um, Black Swan is currently maintained by four other people, so it's also a group. And they organize games, hackathons, and workshops, as well as micro-grants. Um, and I don't want to spoil, but maybe we can already say that it's not a browser-only experience. Um, so it's very much uh, connected to the physical realm. Um, and Black Swan is also potentially critical of uh, certain ideas of automation that are so important for the blockchain space. Um, Jan Berger um, is a visual artist and platform designer based in London and Berlin. And, um, he is uh, occupied with ludic simulation, so the work actually happens as a browser experience on server online and is uh, leaving the physical space very much behind. Um, he's the founder and attending curator of the Mythical Institution, which is a digital project space and art school. And um, there's also a publication coming up on the Mythical Institution uh, called the Mythical Anthology, so um, we should look out for that. Um, <laughs> maybe we'll speak about it in a bit. And you will now deliver a lecture on Bauen, Wohnen, Denken, um, which is a durational role play, um, a series of role plays, I think, that um, explores gaming culture as a space for artistic production, cultural prototyping, and community building. Yes. With this, I hand over <laughs> to you. <laughs> well, thank you for the introduction, Sarah. And thank you for the invitation. And I think without further ado, we're going to start. 
actually, uh, as a little premise, I just banged my head very badly on a door. <laughs> so if anything of this doesn't make sense, we'll attribute it to that, yeah. <laughs> okay. How does that... Yes, okay. Oh, okay. <clears throat> we have a little problem here. I don't see my notes if I do that on full screen. Oh. <laughs> Should we just do it like that? Yeah. Is that fine? Yes. Okay, let's get rid of everything we can. Hi, Tuva. Yeah. Is that okay for you? Can you see everything? You can get rid of the side thing as well. Uh, okay, we'll keep it like that. All right, so, yeah, so bauen, wohnen, denken, which means in English, um, uh, building, dwelling, thinking. Um, is the project and the topics I'm going to talk about is avatar and production within. Is this working if I talk like this? Can you hear me? Great. And speculative cultures. And I guess you're going to hear a bit about speculation also a bit later in the talk. Well, we'll start with a little inspirational, inspirational quote which is by Holly Herndon and she says, we need new institutions to deal with the new problems that are emerging. So that's going to be the structure of the, of the talk, of the lecture I'm giving. So first is the work and then is the fun, yeah? So first we look at the art field systemics, so everything that's going like badly in the art economics. And then we talk about infrastructural play, yeah? And that's, that means we look at nice um, images, yeah? <laughs> All right, but first we start with the dry part. It's not, I try to not make it too dry, yeah? It's going to be a crash course. Yeah, flame means we're going to start with that. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, first of all, what we're confronted with is the legacy art ecosystem that still reigns supreme, which means there's a vertical power organization. Yeah, the art world as we know it. Um, which means the political economy of the art market is neoliberal. Yeah, like everything else. And that means that capital concentration is there by the dominant owners of capital. Yeah. So the dominant owners of capital concentrate capital further. That means what is going on in the art field or in the art market is an extreme segregation and economic inequality, which means we have a one percentification as well. So 10% of all artists, they can live from their art. And 1% of all artists, so 10% of that 10%, they can live quite well from their art or they're kind of like scraping by. But the upper 10%, they concentrate like the like like all funds concentrate like they own the most part of the share and within that one percent like it's concentric circles i'm kind of like messed up with numbers now but okay so the 10 percent the upper 10 percent of the upper 10 percent they own the most and it goes on and on like this which kind of like ends up in this super dense Pluto core in the speak of Suhel Malik. So we have like denser circles, which means we have increasing inequality. So it's not just inequality, but it's increasing inequality. Yeah, in concentric circles. And what's also is that art's reputational economy is pro-elite. So people that um, are there, they stay there. Visibility is centralized, which means we see the same old faces all over again, which is also kind of evidenced by um, the Berlin Art Week, where there was a like super weird prominence of post-internet art, which is kind of like 10 years old already. So that's kind of like, yeah, a symptom of the systemics, I guess. Yeah, did you realize that? No, it was kind <coughs> I of think apparent. It's older no? than 10 years. Huh? I think it's older than 10 years, but <laughs> it's older than 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it died like 10 years ago, no? That's kind of like, um, yeah, so that's kind of, well, that was an observation that was mentioned in the New Models podcast. 
and speaking of new models. The next image is shamelessly taken from them. Um, by Caroline Buster and Lil Internet, they had um, a presentation on the dark forest where they showed this image. And it's kind of like symbolic of what would be an alternative model to that. So what is kind of envisioned here is decentralized ecologies and a kind of like planetary system of art worlds and not like this one vertical, very, um, yeah, very vertical system that we tend to know. And what could be an alter alternative model is we could imagine new ways to allocate resources in there that not just the upper 10% get and most of it the 10% the of the upper 10%, no? And to get this closer to me, yeah. And um, well, we could find economic models where producers are in control instead of, um, yeah, here. Das Schloss, no? Yeah. Um. Where am I? Oh, yeah. And what could also happen? I mean, this is an, an island world from the game Chrono Cross, which kind of symbolizes these different islands that kind of cross pollinate each other. And it's also like kind of localized entities that have their own kind of experiential. Um, premises. And so an alternative model would also engage in pro-complexity and some sort of discourse like we know from the art world already. So it's not just a space where like everyone does whatever they do. No? And anyway, what rearranges culture and society is social media and not legacy institutions. So who is kind of still gaining their knowledge from institutions, like from legacy institutions? No one, right? Like we're going <laughs> online and we see stuff on, I don't know, social media or, yeah, yeah, the internet. All right, so much about that. Potential fixes about that would be, okay, what isn't a potential fix is Web2 subscription services, a way to monetize your work. So Substack and Patreon might be like a way to kind of like um, gatekeep your cultural production, but it's not sustainable in a way that the platform actually mimics whatever happens in the market, I guess. So Patreon got rid of their security um, personnel entirely almost, so that's kind of bad. So these are not sustainable models that we would like to think of, kind of like a middle stage where people are right now, yeah? That's kind of problematic. Um, what would be a potential fix is Web3 with DAOs, which you hear later, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations, um, circular economies, new lateral institutional layers, so another added institutional layer in the institution, whatever that might be, yeah. It's like we're not asking for institutions to, I don't know, explode or something. That would be kind of reactionary. But um, yeah, I guess. People could do something with it. And also an engagement in future art ecosystems. So the tech industry as art patron or art stacks like pitched by the Serpentine um, Gallery um, R&D platform. And what we do or what I'm kind of interested in is to use art as a medium and testbed for strategies against neoliberal gov governance or just as a testbed in general for whatever. Yeah. All right, and now? That was it. And we go for the infrastructural play that's at hand now. So we're going to talk a bit about the project Baumborn Denken. And this is the this is the island world that we built in Baumborn Denken, which is where's my cursor here? So to just tell you a bit about the project, Bound Von Denken is a durational role play series that is occupied with the ludic formation of cultural mythologies and the subjectivities they produce. The project explores gaming culture as a space for artistic production, cultural prototyping and community building. I think this is almost the same what you said before, <laughs> but well, that's what it is about. And what it entails is a Minecraft <laughs> role play that's on server 24 seven, yeah? So I'll show you how the project works in the next slide. Oh, in the slide after that. But um, 
it's an on-server experience, yeah? So people can log on whenever they want, 24-7. And we also had another layer of contextualization, whatever happens in-game. We need some kind of adjustment layer to talk about that. And that was done via Discord, which is uh, a chat infrastructure, yeah? And yeah, the project is hosted by the Mythical Institution, a digital project space and art school. This was the pitch that participants were confronted with. So that's the kind of shared illusion we engaged with. Oblivious of your past identity, you will find yourself on a pristine island. Three factions will inhabit the land, one of which you will be made to join based on your inner beliefs. Together you will build a world developing your society's own cultural tenets and aesthetics. And this is the infrastructure of the project. So do I have a cursor here? Yes. So we have a host group which engages in the role play, but they also do other stuff. And we have participants. And the kind of like not the, the opposite of the great equalizer, the, the great splitter in some kind of way, is a questionnaire we figured out. And this is the mise en place, so this is what happened before the actual role play. And the host group acquires funds and stuff to kind of finance the whole project. And the questionnaire that we had, I'll show it to you later, um, kind of split the group of participants and host group into three houses or factions. Yeah? And each of them has like their own unique um, kind of starting point, like an ideological starting point. And the questionnaire was there to, um, to calibrate the participants. I think we called it the innate affiliation, ideologic aff affiliation or so. In the end, it was like in, I don't know, like German Fernsehzeitung, Brigitte, I don't know, like what type of clothing type are you, winter, summer, whatever, yeah? And then you have to check some things and then in the end you find out that you're the winter type, yeah? Okay, so that was the role play. And while the host group, they commissioned media. So what happened in the role play, this is kind of like an unlucky split here, but within the role play, the three different houses, they formed their own subjectivity and they created lore. So during the play, stuff happened, and then we talked about it, and then more stuff happened, and more interactions happened. Yeah. And in the end, each house was kind of distinct and had their own quirks and lore. And what the host group did, they commissioned media from the houses, so they would engage in being their own ethnologists. Yeah. So they described their own um, ethnology in text and image-based um, formats. And then in the end, there was the, a design commission to yeah, create a publication, which is the devirtualization part of it. So out of an online format, there's born like a publication that is really tangible and people can engage with it and yeah. So it's just not hermetically sealed in its environment that it started off. Yeah, and then there's going to be a physical re release sometime soon. So that's the questionnaire. We had some um, prompts there, which are not shown, but the answers are shown. So whatever people affiliated the most with, they chose, yeah. No one chose the Kelly family, which I'm really, um, I don't know why, yeah? No one chose them, yeah? Um, it was an equal split between Lana Del Rey and Madonna, which kind of like point towards their like ideological affiliation, I guess, yeah? So out of these three given answers that you could choose, each one of them belonged to one of the factions. We have the Aventurine, Meme River, The Matrix, Windmill, Lana Del Rey, and Hope, uh, Crystallos, Essay, Faith, Clockwork, Orange, Mountain, Madonna, Star, and the Carnelians. And what they are, I'm going to show you. Oh, after that, yeah. So we had some rules to abide by because weird stuff can happen if you don't like closely instruct what is appropriate and what is not, especially yeah, in online games where stuff can happen that's like not so cool. And what's probably 
The most interesting here is that we want to experience Minecraft as a material for artistic exploration. As such, we want to avoid its callous gamification culture and resist the urge of gameplay mastery. Which means we just don't want to play the game like the game wants to be played, e.g. the meta game of the game, which is like a format that crystallizes out of gameplay optimization. So we don't want min-maxing, we don't want people to kill other people because they can, but we want people to encourage to play the game in relation to the overall um, objective of the format. Okay, now we watch, uh, yeah, and now the fun part starts, yeah? So these are the factions, or these are the cultures that kind of resulted from the role play part, yeah? So here we see the Aventurine with their little suits, yeah? And I'll just read out the, uh, the culture that resulted. We kind of captured it in a few sentences. So, deeply concerned with slick yet functional designs, the Aventurines seek to accelerate the island's technological development, facilitating numerous semi-automatically operating mechanisms. They endeavor to alleviate the obsolete human burden, oh grand. Aventurine infrastructure is created with an egalitarian approach in mind. Culturally and socially invested, they offer their open source so solutions to mankind. No fees incurred. <coughs> yeah. Um, so these are kind of like the startup people. Yeah. Oh yeah, and I should mention, like all of them had like a unique space that they inhabited. So the Aventurines inhabited the Bay Area. It's kind of like, yeah, okay. And uh, maybe take a look at the sand here, like this white stuff. It's sand. It's going to be interesting later, I guess. The carnelians were here in the forest, and the forest housed native bees. And the crystallos were here on the plateau, yeah, closest to God. Okay. So, and what they did, this is the cultural production that I talked about in the commission part. So that was commissioned from them by the host group. And the host group is also part of the group as well. And via commission, everyone was paid as well in, in equal shares for their production. So what they did is this, um, a boat startup in Minecraft for, yeah, uh, transportation, public transportation, basically. And the aesthetic also, of course, alludes to startup. Yeah, and I guess a bit of Evian here. Yeah. Um, anyway, that's the boat startup called Boast, they did. And they also engaged in, yeah, weird PowerPoint presentations. They were kind of problematizing the um, like fossil, fossil energies. And they said, if we keep on extracting coal, which they use to burn stuff, um, most of all sand, to turn it into glass, they said, if we just carry on with it, the natural sea level at 0.62, that's the height, will rise to 255, which means the whole island will be flooded. Of course, this doesn't happen in Minecraft, but I guess <coughs> uh, they love to role-play that. And they said the solution is natural, with a little icon here. So kelp is an underwater plant, then, then that grows in abundance in the Aventurine Bay and can be dried and then bundled to blocks of intense heating power. So that's how they battle climate change. Uh, yeah in Minecraft. And that's another view um, of the island. And you see, like, all the sand is gone. It's just like a wasteland. Um, and they also started underwater extraction of sand. Um, but they're still very green. I mean, they kept, like, all the cacti that were native on the island. They kept it on little sand pillars. You're going to see that later in the video. Um, and here you see them from the cloud, which is another invention of them. It's, gl it's a glass bridge that connects the two parts of the island, like the, the Crystallos and the Aventurine part of the island, uh, with a glass bridge that is also on cloud level. So it was very weird because the clouds moved like within the glass bridge. Yeah. Of course, the cloud. Yeah, the cloud. Yeah. Like um, the stack, Jan? no? Yeah. yeah. 
Can we shorten a bit the part? Oh my god, if how that's possible? How long is it? <laughs> Just so we all get to discuss later on as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't want to. How long is it? How long did I talk? Maybe twenty-five minutes. Oh my goodness. Okay, fast. Chris Talos. Um, it's a suicide cult. Suicide cult, and we also used. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay, now we go fast. Suicide cult, and we also used. We're more on the gameplay. Uh, part on that. So um, in Minecraft, you die if you don't eat. And we thought, okay, we can also just die as an end in itself. So we jumped down this hole, which we built, but I was part of that. But we told everyone it was there since the beginning of time. So um, we didn't build it, it was just there. We die there. We wake up somewhere else. That's a gameplay mechanic of Minecraft. You can spawn somewhere else. And then you spawn in this um, citadel, we called it. And yeah, you're gonna see it in the video. We want to see the video now. And these are the bees, so the carnelians, they're kind of like the socially minded, like every, everything is done in the collective. Uh, we dance, we do art, we're like, that's how we do it. Um, this is what they did, it was kind of like cottage quarry, <laughs> so, uh, and DIY culture, so how to build the big bee, which they built there. Um, so they made everything, yeah, well, we'll go fast. And a huge wool sunflower, yeah? And then they also made these weird digital oil paintings of their surroundings as a commission. And this one I wanted to absolutely show you because it's the most bizarre uh, drawing uh, of them I encountered. And they have like a mushroom soup there, which they invited us for eating mushroom soup and they wanted us to eat it. Um, to learn how to live in their ways and stuff. So there was also this kind of interaction. Let's look at the faces. Okay, wait. And they also built these murals, wool murals, for, um, to show the history of the island. So um, here are the Cristalos, the suicide cult. Here's the little hole, if you see it. Um, this is a bee. These are the four bee people. This is the big tree. These are the aventurines. They make glass and they, yeah, they burn kelp. It's a nice abstraction, I thought. OK, and there's also a publication. Um, and I heard that the graphic designer is actually here today. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's it. And the publication also reflects the different subjectivities in the graphic design. So we have a graphic design here for the, for the startup part. We have an extreme verticality. Um, of the suicide cult here in the graphic design. And we have the bees. And that's it. Do we have time for the video? How long is it? May we do it at the end? Let's do it at yep. the end, yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Jan. <laughs> it's so interesting that the gameplay series ends in a publication, which is a very sort of legacy institution tool. <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we don't say no to that either. <laughs> and this, <clears throat> sorry, this brings me back to the initial question um, that maybe opens the forum um, to all uh, of us. Um, in which way do you think the specific technologies that you're working with or applications um, in which way do they have specifically um, emancipatory potential? Um, would you like to answer on that, especially maybe through um, Minecraft? Oh yeah, of course. I mean, what we were interested at in first was how does, we call it the art world gamification, so protocols of behavior, how do we behave in the art world? Um, to get the gigs, um, what is kind of appropriate to show as an artwork. I mean, there are codes and conducts. And how does that, like, what's the confluence between there and Minecraft metagame? So um, that's what I was interested in. So it's like, yeah, it's really infrastructural play with conducts in the art field through online gaming. Would it work like an allegory, basically, of the actual world that we experience in the physical realm, and then 
you build a allegory of that in the digital realm and you... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could do that. And you could also... I mean, the digital is always a good tool to use it to prototype, to sidestep um, institutional um, codes or so. Yeah, so, or to redress them. Yeah. Mm. I mean, the best case. And um, Penny, how would you... Um, I mean, you're not working online only, and you're um, obviously not working with Minecraft, but also with games to some extent. Um, so what's your perspective on, on this? I mean, I think that um, in general, the emancipatory potential of technology is very much rooted in who's participating within it. Because technology can swing both ways, uh, left to right, it's extremely complex in its determinism of what you feed it. And even those with the best intentions can often create catastrophic infrastructure around technology, which has very strong knock-on effects to communities that they didn't even intend to uh, hurt with it. What I would say um, in terms of this notion of play, though, I think it goes back to very, very um, early sort of uh, video gaming analogies, which um, is often found in the sphere that people say, if you could play video games to challenge some of the biggest problems in society, um, for example, climate change or uh, in the UK, Liz Truss's idea of abolishing the 45p tax um, rights. If you could actually play that out, you would have a set of conclusions and evaluations before you even put that onto a human body. And I think by using pay to paper prototyping, you're not committing to code, you still have flexibility. And also through gamification, Typically what people do within a game is they play a character or archetype that sometimes has a little darker edge than they would necessarily give out. You know, I'm not going to play my darkest edge right now. <laughs> Obviously, I want you to like me. Um, but within a game, I could actually bring that out. And so you actually have also um, a much more complex mode of testing people's emotional and social responses. And I think that's really important in terms of um, gathering data for technology. And I think that also goes back to something that um, me and Ruth speak about a lot together, and that's very much about how one should put cultures before structures. And that also goes for technology. People should look at the user, look at the society that they're trying to build to, and those are the people who should be involved. And I think that can also leak out of technology. Because, um, for example, and that's also a sort of framing that hopefully I'll unpack a little bit in a second, but this idea that within these spectrums, you know, you can apply other things on top of them. Um, for example, you know, it's not just within the art world that we have these problems of resource distribution or um, gender inequality, race inequality, ableism, ageism, um, these, these happen across society. But what we do have in the art institutions is often we don't have a transparency of why decisions are being made and why resources are being applied. And this comes from somewhere else that we don't often, as users, have access to. And that also happens with policymaking on a broader level. The people who are distributing housing and social aid very rarely need the housing and social aid. So I want to uh, situate an idea of emancipatory technology in the fact that those users who need them are exploring how resources are distributed, and they know best what they need, not somebody who's never stepped foot into their world. So there's also about this idea that Jan mentioned earlier about um, art functioning as a sandbox, right? Exactly. Um, does that also play a role in your work, maybe while writing, but also um, thinking of um, your other installations that you're working on? Mm, yeah, I mean, like currently I'm really invested in artificial intelligence and all things going on there. And to me, like the emancipatory um, aspect of those things is like it... it kind of uh, kills the need for talent, <laughs> like for artistic <laughs> talent and like not 
not today right now but like it's going there it's it's an ongoing development and it's it's really fast <laughs> like every week there's new new uh, ai model now there's text to video it uh, half a year was only uh, text to image that has gotten better and better um, it kind of kills the need to take like stock photography so um, it's it's really like it's on some in some way it's threatening to us uh, visual artists but also it's like empowering because it's not like oh you have you were born with this talent or you just like you kept drawing all your life and so now you're better than the next person with maybe a really good idea but that person is not really able to express it in a in a visual way that it's pleasing or like reaching people so um I try to open up to the idea that um, like the final visual image that you see, it doesn't matter how it got created. Like it's, it's not about if, yeah, not about the talent, only about the tools and in the end only about the ideas behind it. And also all those ideas can, can um, yeah, be generated with the help of AI. So, um, yeah. It's it's immense, uh, immense. How do you say emancipating uh, to the artist? But um, you really have to keep track of what's going on. So it can also be overwhelming, and then you feel like, okay, I can't do anything at all now. And so yeah, it goes both ways, I guess. Mm. Um, I would like to pick up on uh, on this notion of automation because I think it's also an important. Um, claim, let's say, of the blockchain space um, that many people feel is um, helping maybe to redistribute um, certain um, decision processes, to redistribute power. Um, and, and obviously we know there's like very, um, it's a vast space and there's very different politics also. Uh, maybe, uh, Penny, if you could also, by way of introducing Black Swan, a bit um, map that field a little bit for us. <laughs> uh, sorry, everyone <laughs> needs to talk about automation or Black Swan? Well, maybe um, describing the blockchain space a bit and the role of automation, if that's, if that's something that is like emancipatory or, let's say, helps in redistributing um, power in a certain way, but then also how it relates to Black Swan. I don't know if this is possible even or like too much of a bridge. <laughs> I feel like I'm like trying to negotiate this piece of paper and the questions <laughs> without having to uh, yeah, break your new material. Uh, firstly, <laughs> automation is a fallacy. <laughs> like, that would be my answer. Um, there is not really such a thing as automation on the blockchain in terms of uh, redistribution of resources to more equitable um, means. Because you still have the social, like you still have human beings. The only level of automation that you have on the blockchain is in code. And of course, and this is actually really interesting in terms of like some of the problems and the hacks that came up within blockchain, because you know you, of course, the blockchain space is also fractured in terms of how it um, acts politically, and so you have these people that are sort of code purists. And of course, the, the original notion of the blockchain was to get rid of um, these problematic human beings that kept uh, fucking everything up with their melodramas and their social I mean, Jan contracts. Jan talked about the fixes <laughs> earlier. <laughs> um, and so actually, I will speak to a little bit in the presentation, this idea, um, well, that happened in 2016 called the DAO hack which was actually when resources were being drained out of this huge crowd pooling facility. And some people within that DAO, they could see millions and millions going out of it. But because they were code purists and the code had been hacked, this is what was supposed to happen. <laughs> so they were actually in some way like very calm and collected, believing in code, watching millions and millions exit the account. Uh, very funnily enough, uh, that line of code was uh, on page 666, which of course is Alistair Crowley's beast. 
Um, and it actually just happens through, instead of a small t, there was a capitalization. Um, and that's basically how millions and millions were uh, exited the, the first DAO. Um, but I, yeah, so sort of around that notion, what I want to sort of promote is the idea that what is kind of good about automation in this aspect, and I think what we also found in terms of this DAO hack of millions uh, exiting, is the fact that the code will act upon the code. And what you have in um, DAO spaces and blockchain spaces um, is this idea that regardless of governmental or nation state occurrences, that code will be executed if a certain amount of the contract is upholding that. And why I think like, uh, Sorry, doing my presentation. Is that okay? Of course. Go okay. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what's yeah really sort of complicated about that, of course, is like you know if you are outside of the government infrastructure, that could be a very free market ledger. Or alternatively, you could have a fascist government or an absence of government. So like, there's actually ways in which you can see an inherent good from a leftist progressive perspective, but also inherent horrific hellscapes that can evolve <coughs> through blockchain automation. And I guess it really depends on like what you fundamentally believe in would make your world and your landscape better. And in terms of all of this sort of blockchain rhetoric and what I have found myself um, pilfering through and where I sort of activated within Black Swan is that I find it very important to keep myself up to date with the technological transformations that are occurring within also the financialized version of the blockchain. But saying that, I'm more of a spectator in this um, turmoil. And what I did in 2018 was I sort of ciphered off um, philosophy that was brought about in blockchain and decentralized autonomous organizations. And from siphoning this off, um, I tried to write out an alternative funding model for a Berlin-based local art scene. And this uh, funding model was based a lot on what was happening in 2018, and that actually hasn't changed so much. In fact, it potentially has gotten worse in terms of, and I think Sarah mentioned it earlier in the opening that we're losing a lot of physical space. We also have made shifts and moves towards a more intersectional um, art scene, but there's still a lot of problems there. Also in terms of the connection between resource holders and the people who use the resources, there's often um, a shift or a lack of understanding in terms of the connection between the users and the gatekeepers. And from this, I started to apply this knowledge of DAOs, which is typically a DAO is like a pooling pot where you have stakeholders and you have users. And in the original blockchain DAOs, this was actually the same person. So, you know, we'd all put uh, our resources into a pool. Let's, uh, for simplicity, say it's cryptocurrencies. We pool that together. And then each one of us can put in a proposal, and if we vote upon it, uh, Sarah gets X amount of resources uh, to Sarah's proposal. And this is how a sort of typical DAO worked. But I felt that this wasn't um, reasonable, because I don't think that artists should be crowdfunding. I think artists have a difficult job as it is in order to create, conduct, conjure ideas, think through things, and also to be able to manifest. Like their role shouldn't also be administration and crowdfunding and so forth. 
And what I also had noticed, which is a term that Kate Brown uh, coined, is this notion of grooming, which basically is the idea that within an art scene, you have these kind of emerging levels. And from this very uh, young artists going into the scene, typically a lot of how their artwork is actually held by the community is through favors. It's from unpaid interns, it's from friends, it's from project spaces, and really this kind of community gathers around these artists and really kind of um, pins out their career. And to a certain point, they emerge. And what happens is the legacy institutions, blue chip galleries, they often then very interested in this artist that's come to a certain level in their career. And then we'll generally sort of skim off the top of it. And uh, then, of course, the career continues to grow. And what Black Swan does, it actually begins to hold those people with resources, the legacy institutions, the blue chip galleries, and the stakers um, to account. So basically what Black Swan does is it works between these two um, parts of the art world, the users being the cultural workers and the stakeholders, the people who hold resources. And what we've been doing for the last couple of years is basically running sort of beta tests and models where we have spoken to resource holders and ask them to stake into these pools and pots that are then actually um, distributed by the artists through the artists. And this is also kind of um, trying to interrupt things like the gift economy, which is um, often the way in which the art world is run. So for example, you may get a residency when actually you need money and you don't need to be going halfway across the world, but you have this residency, mm. so you're going to do it, right? Uh, so these are sort of like discussions and conversations that come up within the DAO itself. For example, there may be a residency in there and Sarah needs it and you need something else that's in there. So it's about also instead of the artists trying to mold their practices to the resources that they have been given, they're actually then able to, uh, from their conceptual underpinnings and affordances, um, actually apply for these resources that are then voted on by the rest of the community. There's also alternative economies that come up in terms of uh, proposal and voting systems. So for example, sorry, I'm just using you all for slides right now. But for example, uh, Sarah might have written a proposal where she needs a videographer. Felix, you might have seen this proposal, realized that Sarah didn't get the money for it. But you know Sarah is an amazing writer, so you exchange on another way and also to gain sort of a more complexity of conceptual affordances and pinning around the dialogues that your local community is creating. Um, we have had a huge amount of response uh, from both artists and also silent stakeholders. And what I also have to say is that maybe I'm like the antithesis of your <laughs> um, initial uh, projections, because I actually do think that legacy institutions do hold a really crucial part of the art world. I also really believe in public institutions um, as well. And I think that there has been a breakdown and hopefully sort of the beginnings of like new conversations and systems and structures and affordances that come through a more horizontal determination instead of having this kind of uh, top-down power infrastructure, which we've seen in the past, which of course does engage predominantly in market value systems. Um, so this is actually what Black Swan is trying to do. And um, yeah. Did that answer? That was a very long... No, that was great. Um, <clears throat> so the, the bridge that we built through the automation um, was really just the spark, basically, but I think it was, um, it was really interesting um, to hear that, and it's something... Um, yeah, I think that 
an, an art project, um, that an organization can be an art project, I think is something uh, noteworthy in this context and that the art project actually um, does almost develop a life on its own and I think this is also something that both Jan and Felix you are sort of like working on or working with a little bit. Um, and there's been this differentiation between organizations and platforms. Um, so there's like all this like language coming from the digital space when we talk about our practices. Um, would you, Jan, say something about um, this idea of the platform and how, for example, the mythical institution um, might be a new sort of institution and um, yeah, how you conceive this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it kind of arcs back to what I said in the beginning about the current art ecosystem and how it functions. And the mythical institution was really just, um, I mean, we were thinking how to sidestep the, in, the art legacy, um, yeah, ramifications on like young artists who do not already have like this huge institutional reputation to be able to do like grand scale um, exhibitions. And then we were, were like, yeah, in Minecraft you can just generate material, like it's for free, right? And then you can just build your institution and then you can just, I don't know, um, if you want to do something grand scale, you can do something grand scale. Um, at some point we also exploded the whole thing because we were tired of it. And that's also possible without any um, yeah, physical um, repercussions, I guess. Um, and the institution that you're sort of um, envisioning, um, is there a similarity maybe to this distributed model that we saw in Jan's presentation with the little islands or um, how, because you spoke so much on the um, relation between the stakeholders or the silent stakeholders and the users, um, how do you see that uh, playing out? Uh, I think um, from the position of Black Swan, which also is aiming itself to be an open source uh, DAO technology. So for example, at the moment we already have Signet, which is a quadratic voting application, which um, actually changes the one vote, one person rhetoric that we're typically used for and creates a more consensus building model um, which is actually also based on the moon cycles um, rather than um, systems to, of dates um, from a typical uh, calendar system. And I think in terms of what Black Swan's research has found is that actually scalability of communities doesn't often work. Uh, especially when it comes to resource distribution. Because imagine that you had um, a community that's based on 20 people putting in proposals. That's a fair amount of labor, as it is, to read those. Um, but imagine if you had 200 people putting in proposals. This is an inherent amount of labor that I wouldn't do and I'm already convinced this is a good tool, um, but that provides a certain amount of fatigue to your community. So what I would suggest is more of a micro-gridded governance systems, so that small pockets of communities that are fairly self-reliant and self-determinant, but they do have um, pathways to each other. That also is, of course, in the case of open source technology, a really important thing that, you know, I can produce a part of a code and then you find that it's interesting or something that you can build on top of. And I think that's also something that is really important for my understanding of decentralized autonomous organizations and is that is that they're fluid and they're malleable and there isn't like a one size fits all each different community will be very different um, based either on their level um, of, for example, where they are in their career, also potentially based on their culture 
systems that they come into contact with. Um, but there's often kind of crossovers or continuums that we can learn from each other. So in a way, I would say it's probably this like um, dotting of islands, but with bridges <laughs> between them, um, which I think is also speaks more to translocal ideology rather than universalism. But how are you connecting like all the players inside those um, yeah, systems or islands? Is, is Black Swan like a, like a platform per se or... How, how are they keeping in touch or know about each other? So. Well, that would be something called the internet. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so it's not like I go to a certain... No, I mean, it's also, you know, this, uh, this is like how I've come to the DAO space as well. Um, there, there's this huge amount of peer review and peer interest. And I think that's also what you'll find within a blockchain space mm -hmm. as well. Um, and there's, you know, not only peer review, but there's also this notion of the hacker, right? To, um, to create something and undo it and to remodel it. And I think this is like super important in terms of um, us building other structures. And I know that like the, the notion of the hacker often gets like a bad rep because, you know, they'll steal your credit card details and so forth. But what they also do is they show weak points in the system. And they show that through praxis rather than through cancel culture or rather than through sort of hater dialogue. And, you know, what's happening there is showing the vulnerability in your politics, which is, which is hard, you know, to suddenly be vulnerable. But isn't it better to be vulnerable and to be able to fix something? rather than to be vulnerable and to hurt somebody later on down the line? What a question. <laughs> um, I'm going to build now um, a very lofty bridge um, to <laughs> your work, Felix, um, because we don't have so much time left. I hope you still have energy, but I would really love for you to, um, to read from your book, uh, Lexi X, And I think we will re-encounter some of these questions, um, maybe starting from the consensus topic that we had touched upon, um, but um, yeah, also re-encountering this sort of uh, cultural prototype of the starving artist, which is the protagonist yeah. <laughs> um, of the story. And um, yeah, I'll get, hand over to you and maybe we have a few um, last thoughts after this. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks for the bridge. <laughs> um, I hope it's okay if I switch to German now because it's a German novel, and yeah, I I just yeah think it's or maybe I can I can try to do the introduction in English, but yeah, the reading part obviously has to be in German. So um, yeah, it's 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 my third novel. It's um, basically also incorporating ideas about um, AI and um, artificial. Um, beings, um, simulated humans. Um, so we have this two main protagonists living each in their own um, reality. Um, one is Lexi van Dijk, a, a young um, woman artist, um, a performance artist, and um, she's like kind of yeah. She's at this emerging point where she, it's 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 going okay, but she has to do still do most of the work herself. Um, And what she doesn't know is that her whole reality is simulated um, and her reality uh, resembles our world right now. So it's um, her, her, um, yeah, her narration is really reminding the reader on, yeah, of our own uh, state, of the, uh, state of the world right now. And um, the, her simulation is being simulated in a higher reality where the second uh, character, Sol, um, he's working at a, at a big company who's doing the simulation. Um, his reality is like uh, maybe a hundred years uh, more advanced than we are right now, so they um, are already incorporating um, humanoids uh, in their in their day-to-day -day work, um, taking care of, of the care labor and um, for, for lower tasks that, um, that are needed. And um, yeah, this soul character, he's um, 
like his job is to uh, watch the simulation running and they're like there are a lot of uh, um, Uh, people observing the simulation. Um, Sol has um, um, so <laughs> he's he's working in the in the cultural um, observation um, room. So he's he's like taking care of the art world while some uh, other people are taking care of the finances or politics. And um, but he's he's getting stuck on this Lexi character. So he should be really more all over the place. What's going on? in the art world, in the simulation, but he's like stuck, um, stuck on, on this Lexi character. And um, so, yeah, short introduction maybe. And now I could uh, start with, with a scene um, from Seoul after a day of watching Lexi on his screen. And uh, yeah, now I switch to German. <laughs> okay. Lexis Zimmer wird in rotes Licht gehüllt. Ein tiefer Farbton pulsiert und taucht Bett, Laken und Lexi in Weinrot. So sehr bin ich anscheinend in dieser Übertragung verloren, dass ich einen Moment brauche, dieses Farbenspiel zu verstehen. Es ist die Erinnerung an meine Mittagspause. Ich stehe auf und massiere mir die Augen unter der Brille. Es fühlt sich an, als verlasse ich zum ersten Mal seit Wochen meine Sichtungskabine. Hier drinnen führe ich ein Leben außerhalb von Zeit und Raum und eigentlich auch außerhalb meines eigenen Körpers. Ist das nicht die Definition von Zen? Wieso bin ich nicht entspannter? Ich glaube, ich bin ein wenig süchtig geworden. Ich will nur gucken und gucken und gucken. Schlimm, wenn man wieder auf sich selbst zurückgeworfen wird. Das eigene, belanglose Leben ist so anstrengend geworden. Wenn man auf die 40 zugeht, will man keine Entscheidungen mehr treffen. Was soll ich mir kaufen? Wen soll ich treffen? Was wird aus mir? Es ist egal. Es ist langweilig. Viel schöner ist es doch zu sehen, wie Lexi alles macht. Nur kann ich sie jetzt kaum noch richtig erkennen. Der automatische Timer dunkelt all meine Bildschirme ab. Das Symbol einer roten Pille leuchtet mir achtfach entgegen. Zwangspause. Ich habe überhaupt keine Lust, mich um meine Ernährung zu kümmern, egal wie einfach sie es einem mittlerweile machen. Vor ein paar Jahren hat Farmtech ein neues Produkt vorgestellt. Zwei bis drei Kapseln am Tag genügen, geschmacksneutral und ohne Sodbrennen. Vor lauter Lexi habe ich die letzte Ration vergessen und jetzt merke ich es im Magen. Es ist komisch, wenn sich der eigene Körper so meldet. Er ist mir in letzter Zeit ein bisschen zum Fremdkörper geworden. Ich schleiche aus meiner abgedunkelten Kabine. Durch die Jalousien im Gang fällt das Licht in Streifen. Ich nehme das Treppenhaus zur Kantine, um niemandem im Aufzug be zu begegnen. Was soll man schon sagen vom 22. in den zweiten Stock? Einmal habe ich mir ein Smalltalk-Buch auf einem Flohmarkt gekauft und es ungelesen weggeworfen. Aus Angst, es zwänge mich zu etwas, was ich nicht kann. So ein Mensch bin ich nicht, der im Aufzug redet. Unten angekommen, lächle ich mechanisch in den Gesichtsscanner und betrete die Kantine. Früher hätte man zu solch einer Maschine Kaugummiautomat gesagt, aus der ich jetzt meine Pillen ziehe. Von der Firma subventioniert, sie haben hier schon noch, richtige, sie haben hier schon noch richtiges Essen, Kraut, Knödel, Pastete. Aber das kostet das Dreifache von früher. Die Welt entwickelt sich unter meinen Fingern weg. Ich kann das nicht greifen, an allen Ecken und Enden wird optimiert, bis alles weg ist, was, was einmal mein Leben war. So that's just like a short <laughs> glimpse into... Ja, oder ich bleibe jetzt bei Deutsch. <lacht> Kleiner Einblick in, in den Arbeitsalltag von Sol, der eben extrem digitalisiert ist und er, also man sieht schon, er vernachlässigt seinen Körper extrem und diese beiden verschiedenen Realitätsebenen zwischen Lexi und Sol kann man auch eigentlich über den Körper ganz gut ähm, ja, klar machen. Also Sol, der sein, dem ist der Körper zur Last gefallen mittlerweile. Ähm, es wird eigentlich nur noch durch, die, durch das Digitale erinnert, dass er noch einen Körper hat, um den er sich kümmern muss. Und ähm, Lexi arbeitet aber mit ihrem Körper, sie ist noch im Analogen äh, verhaftet und ähm, macht eben sehr körperliche Performances ähm, und das Physische ist eben da noch viel mehr Teil ihres Alltags, auch wenn das Digitale da schon auch anfängt, sehr viel zu verändern. Ähm, ich würde jetzt noch eine kleine Szene noch bei Sol äh, vorlesen. Er wird ein paar Tage später suspendiert, weil er äh, angefangen hat, sich zu sehr in die Simulationen einzuklinken. Äh, ähm, und ähm, ja, hat dann plötzlich zum ersten Mal Tag, äh, Zeit, äh, mitten am Tag seine eigene Stadt zu erkunden, weil er eigentlich sonst zwischen ja, seinem, seinem Apartment und der Arbeit ähm, wechselt äh, und eben so fixiert ist auf Lexi, dass er überhaupt nichts mehr von der Außenwelt normal mitbekommt, aber er darf nicht mehr in die Firma zurück und ähm, ja, ist jetzt plötzlich auf sich selbst zurückgeworfen und ähm, in der Stadt. Unten am Strand schreit jetzt ein Mann und schmeißt irgendwas ins Wasser. Instinktiv zuckt mein rechter Zeigefinger. 
Es ist für mich unerträglich geworden, nicht die gesamte Geschichte einer Person mit einem einzigen Mausklick vor mir ausbreiten zu können. Wie soll man mit all diesen vielen fremden Geheimnissen durchs Leben gehen? Wie soll man eine Welt ertragen, von der das meiste für immer im Verborgenen bleibt? Bei Lexi könnte ich jetzt schnell mal gucken, wie es mit dem, was es mit dem Typen so auf sich hat und ihr die Angst nehmen. Nichts würde mich dort überraschen oder überfordern. Ich schließe die Augen und merke, dass ich all meine Eindrücke und Gedanken in Relation zu Lexi setze. Ohne sie gibt es mich nicht mehr. Ich habe genug von der schönen Aussicht und gehe in einen Supermarkt, weil ich keine Pillen dabei habe und sich der Hunger in meinem, in meinem von Sahne übersäuerten Magen meldet. Die Ration aus dem Tantra gestern hat überhaupt nicht vorgehalten. Unbeholfen schleiche ich durch die Gänge und finde mich kaum zurecht. Alle Regale sehen gleich aus. Im Gegensatz zu früher gibt es keine Werbung mehr zwischen den Reihen, keine Poster oder Farben an den Wänden. Die anderen Kunden sind ausschließlich Humanoide, die für ihre Besitzer den Einkauf machen. Seit ich, meine Human Seit ich meine Humanoide habe, war ich ja auch nicht mehr in solch einem Laden. Die Maschinen sehen mich etwas schräg an. Schon wieder fühle ich mich fehl am Platz. Dabei müsste es eigentlich umgekehrt sein. Irgendwann finde ich eine kleine Dose mit meinen Pillen, doch sehe ich weit und breit keine Kasse, um sie zu bezahlen. Ich gehe in Richtung Ausgang und versuche zu verstehen, wie es die Humanoiden machen. Da rempelt mich, rempelt mich jemand von hinten an. Ich wende mich um und sehe einen männlichen Humanoiden, der eine Metallbox voller Einmachgläser hinter sich herzieht. Ey, geht's noch, entfährt es mir deutlich lauter als gedacht. Noch mehr künstliche Augen richten sich auf mich. Ich wollte nur vorbei, sagt die Maschine mit leerer Miene. Du hast dir dein Verhalten echt von der falschen Sitcom abgeschaut. Ich erkenne mich kaum wieder. Ich wollte nur vorbei, wiederholt der Humanoide. Sag mir wenigstens, wo hier die Kassen sind. Kassen, wiederholt er langsam. In welcher Beta-Version bist du denn hängen geblieben? Kassiere an Gummibändern, die müssen ja hier irgendwo sein. Ich weiß es nicht. Seine Stimme erinnert mich an meinen Personal Assistant. Ironischerweise macht das Zugeben von Wissenslücken die Humanoiden irgendwie menschlicher als alles andere. Wie kaufe ich diese Scheiße hier, schreie ich jetzt. Ach so, um eine Ware zu kaufen, geht man mit ihr durch den Scanner am Ausgang. Der Inhalt deiner Tasche wird erkannt und das Geld wird automatisch von deinem Terminal abgebucht. Ich nehme die Sachen einfach mit raus und das war's. Der Humanoide nickt und ich möchte ihm mit aller Kraft eine reinhauen. Dabei ist das System an sich ja durchaus praktisch. Es ist kaum zu glauben, welche verborgenen Aggressionen diese Maschinen in mir wecken. Draußen ist die Sonne weg und auch weniger Menschen sind auf der Straße, als hätten sich alle abgesprochen. Ich öffne meine Pillendose und schmeiße das kleine Päckchen mit dem luftentfeuchter Granulat neben den Mülleimer. Ich möchte ein bisschen asozial gegen die Welt sein. Dafür bleibt mir die Pille im trockenen Hals stecken. Ich muss unkontrolliert husten. Der Humanoide von ge gerade eben verlässt den Laden und kommt an mir vorbei. Er hört mich röcheln und klopft mir auf den Rücken. Völlig unabhängig davon rutscht die Pille endlich den Hals hinunter. Mit geröteten Augen starre ich den Typen an. Seit wann dürft ihr fremde Menschen berühren, huste ich. In Notsituationen stellen wir das körperliche Wohl der Menschen über etwaige ethische Richtlinien, schon seit dem Update Anfang des Jahres. Der Humanoide sieht das Granulatpäckchen auf dem Boden liegen und wirft es in den Müll. Tschüss, sagt er und kehrt mir den Rücken zu. Ja, ich weiß nicht, haben wir noch Zeit für eine kurze Sequenz oder ja. wollen wir für ja, Fragen? Schon. Okay, <lacht> dann würde ich nämlich noch mal kurz zu der äh, Protagonistin Lexi springen, äh, Seite 2 im Roman, ganz am Anfang. Sie ist auf dem Weg ähm, in ein Hotel, um zu übernachten in, einem anderen, äh, in einer anderen Stadt, weil sie am Tag drauf eine Performance in einem, in einem Museum haben wird. Ähm, aber wie gesagt, sie macht den Transport selber, die Skulpturen sind in ihrem Auto ähm, ja, und ist so ein bisschen sehr alleine auf sich zurückgeworfen. Ähm, ja, also Perspektive von Lexi. Auf der Straße ist niemand unterwegs. Mein Wagen ist der einzige weit und breit. Es ist ziemlich spät geworden. Ich hätte den Tag besser nutzen können, doch ich hatte heute in der Sonne, bis sie hinter den Felsen verschwand. An der Bude gönnte ich mir einen Pölser, obwohl ich seit zwei Jahren kein Fleisch mehr gegessen habe. Außer meinem Gewissen hat das keiner gemerkt. Ein heller Scheinwerfer holt mich zurück ins Jetzt. Auf der anderen Brückenseite kommt mir ein Auto entgegen. Wie schnell ist der denn? Aufgeblendet, was für ein Idiot. Oder eine Idiotin? Bei Autofahrenden geht man immer von aggressiven Männern aus. Ich kann es nicht erkennen. Viel zu grell kommt der Wagen. Über dem Steuer sehe ich nur zwei Augen ohne Gesicht. Schmunzelnd singe ich den Refrain des Songs Eyes Without a Face, der gerade im Radio läuft. Aber ich kann meine Freude über diesen unglaublichen Zufall mit niemandem teilen. Wenn man allein ist, ist das Schöne gar nicht schön. In Gedanken formuliere ich einen Tweet. Auf dem Weg zu Eyes Without a Face. Ich liebe das Leben. Sollte ich den Text mit einem Smiley abschließen, um ihn etwas menschlicher zu gestalten? Vielleicht auch zu Angeberin. 
Kommt das arrogant? Egal, die meisten folgen mir eh nur aus Neid. Ich stoppe den Wagen in, meiner, in einer Notbucht und öffne Twitter. Ich tippe. Auf der Längsbrücke der Welt. Eine Raserin in der Nacht. Nur ihre Augen funkeln in der Dunkelheit. Im Radio. Eyes without a face. Universum, was willst du mir sagen? Ja, das ist besser. Weniger ichbezogen. Philosophischer. Und ein bisschen atheistische Grundhaltung schwingt auch noch mit, weil ich bei einem Zufall nicht gleich an Gott denke. Bevor es weitergeht, möchte ich nachsehen, ob jemand auf meinen Tweet reagiert hat. Minute online, zwei Likes. Das ist hart. Wahrscheinlich muss man das alles wirklich erlebt haben, um es zu verstehen. Vielleicht schiebe ich im Hotel noch einen Tweet hinterher. Ja, das wäre vielleicht das Klügste. Meine Scheibe hat zu schwitzen begonnen. Richtig kalt ist es draußen geworden. Dabei lag ich vorgestern noch nackt auf dem Balkon meiner WG. Ich justiere das Gebläse der Heizung. Eine leuchtende Anzeigetafel lässt mich wissen. Filzgrund, 55 Kilometer, vorsichtig fahren, Bodenfrost. Darunter eine ganz grobe Animation eines schlingernden Wagens. Wahrscheinlich nur 20 Mal. Dabei bemerke ich gar nicht, dass Ice Without a Face schon längst vorbei ist. Die Tage kommen. Der Code für den Selbstcheck-In des Hotels funktioniert nicht. Es hat zu nieseln begonnen und die verschlossene Rezeption hat kein Vordach. Wieso lasse ich mich immer Filz ein? Um die Anfahrt musste ich mich auch schon kümmern. Das Museum hat nur eine Nacht gesponsert. Check-in 24-7 möglich, hieß es in der vom Museum weitergeleiteten Buchungsmail. Zum dritten Mal analysiere ich die Nachricht mit den Daten. Ich finde nur eine Buchungsnummer, aber diese öffnet einfach nicht die Tür. Bei Fragen und Anregungen wenden Sie sich jederzeit per WhatsApp an uns. Ich schicke eine WhatsApp in den Äther. Steh im Regen und komm hier nicht rein. Der Code für den Eingang funktioniert nicht. Eine Sekunde später kommt eine automatisierte Nachricht eines Chatbots mit dem Hinweis, uh, the, our process until now was always like, we create everything, we, we, we read books, we, we create the story, we write a lot and then that's it. We, if we are happy, then, then that's it. And this was like the first time where like an outside system, <laughs> albeit like AI, um, was really um, shaping, shaping the, the final art piece. Yeah. Mm, it's interesting. And um, speaking of this uh, work, um, Delphi Demos, um, there we have a different setting. Um, so here it's a human who is um, supposedly uh, watching an AI character mm. um, living in a past, which is also curious that mm. um, people wouldn't be making future scenarios as we have seen with like Black Swan or the mythical institution, but here it's like looking into the different direction. Yeah. Um, and we have a similar setting at the, actually at the Delphi Demos work where there's um, a woman uh, directing questions, like very political questions towards um, a sort of um, artificial uh, it, it, intelligence. Yeah, or um, we, we call it an oracle, an which, oracle. Is, which is like a, a, an image generation AI. So mm -hmm. I don't know if... Uh, People also already used it. Like there, there are a lot of different solutions right now, like Dali 2 or an, an app called Wombo. It's, that's free, and that we also used um, to create those those images. Sorry, but no, no, like go a, ahead. A, Sorry, I didn't. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. And and there are kind of similarities. I mean, it's really interesting to um, to just create empathy to to um, artificial um, consciousness like to really think really like on a philo philosophical level also will there be any time in the future where we really say for sure okay this ai system is conscious i i can because it's it's a central point in the book as well and thinking about it i don't think there will ever will be um, a point where we say now for sure this system is conscious we will i think we might always um, say, well, we know how the code runs and it's really a good simulation of consciousness, but it's not real consciousness. So, um, yeah, that mm. was a... Yeah, I mean, I think there's different um, uh, definitions of artificial intelligence. Um, and I think one, uh, if you think of artificial intelligence as something that uh, we don't know yet, then um, it's not really the point, actually, when, yeah. you, you know, when you can... It's very human, a human hybrid uh, to say, okay, we, we are only um, the ones uh, saying what is conscious and what not. So mm. there could be a completely different kind of consciousness, which <laughs> is far superior to us and we don't even recognize it. Yeah, I mean, then other technologists, again, of course, would 
um, say that by 2029 we have achieved a sort of um, a combined uh, biological and um, artificial um, neural system, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but thinking of, uh, and this might be my last question also opening up again to um, the forum. <laughs> um, the, the protagonist in the video, um, Delphi Demos is, uh, seems to be very unsatisfied by the answers that she gets, or the images that are mm. shown to her. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering also, in sort of wrapping up this, this panel and, and the question of like how we deal with technologies and whether they can open up space for emancipatory practices, um, if technology uh, can actually answer political questions in some sense, right? Do you think um, the the oracle would have an answer to that? <laughs> well, I mean, the oracle is, and that's like the crucial thing with AI. It's filtering what it knows and like the data it got through us, so it can't really have like new insight. Currently, maybe it, we will get to that point. But currently, if you type something in into those uh, apps and you get like an image out, it's like it just f filters reality through its own uh, system. So that's the frustrating part for for the main character because she's she she simulated and she just asks questions about the world outside her system. So she she has like fake memories of of real people of of real humans, but. Um, yeah, she wants to see it and, and wants to see the status quo. And this oracle just spits out like really distorted, weird images because we humans or the human pro programmers um, eliminated the knowledge of humans and animals from this app because you uh, might produce like pornography or violent images. So this AI in this uh, um, case doesn't know about like how humans look. So it's really a distorted uh, kind of reality uh, or like, like Plato's cave allegory where you just see shadows of reality and you think, okay, maybe I know what is meant by that, but it's never the real thing, so yeah. And um, Jan, maybe if we go back to the lecture um, that started the conversation, um, how would you see this sort of translation moment um, of or like what kind of questions did you start with and how did they change or what could be um, the technologically induced answer <laughs> mm. that we can derive? So I think the mythical institution really doesn't give any answers to that. I guess what it is, is an infrastructural play that's based on systemics in the art world. Um, and what it offers, I think, is a kind of egalitarian space with some kind of experience. Um, I guess it's just an apparatus for like an art production that can happen. I don't think it offers any solutions. Yeah. No fixes, then you promise us fixes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> oops. <laughs> And maybe to close it off, um, Penny, is there something, I mean, there's, um, there has been like very actual events happening uh, through Black Swan. Um, maybe you can give like a short example of one of the instances, um, or maybe also looking into the future, what's to come. <laughs> Actually, can I answer the first question? Sure. You gave to Felix yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> Um, because I thought it was so interesting in terms of this notion uh, whether technology can produce political answers, right? Um, because I would inherently say that technology is political. And what technology maybe offers us is an arena in which we can create conversations through. and. I just want to try to <laughs> formulate this together because what I was thinking in terms of this question um, and your answer is also a project that um, Matt Dryhurst and Holly Herndon are um, beginning to speculate over and that's about artists being able to opt out of whether AI uses their artwork in order to machinically learn its mm -hmm. output such as Dali. And I think the technology had to come up in order for us to begin to speak about, you know, what is quantitative collective knowledge? 
What is copyright of an idea? Can you trace an idea's copyright? What can we say is consensually given to us before it comes out as a creative mm. idea? What's non-consensually absorbed? You know, you have this thing called crypto amnesia, where it's literally when you've seen something or read something, but you've actually forgotten that you did not have that original thought yourself, <laughs> but somebody did. And, you know, this is all about sort of staking alternate worlds. And I think technology allows us to begin to pin in some of those conversations and those arguments through very physical, pragmatic um, code. And I think in terms of this, it also allows us to realize what we want to build and what we want to stake into. And also in terms of political technologies, what do we want to citation? Uh, Sarah Ahmed has this beautiful idea of feminist citation um, being actually feminist blocks and chains that we create in order to proliferate the worlds that feminist thinkers and intersectional writers have created instead of quoting um, maybe more well-known, maybe gender-biased or class-biased writers that have a much more um, well-known aver because of the market. And I think this in itself is also a technology, and it's also kind of beautiful to link it back to the fact that you know blockchain also uses blocks and chain rhetoric. And I think what we've done for so many years is understood technology to not be social, and that it's something um, material that isn't an extension of ourselves. And I think maybe those moments are shifting and changing, whether that's through the empathy of AI, whether that's to building proto-institutions, or also finding alternate world models to be able to talk about what we want to be involved in, in terms of governance, structure, and resources um, for a potentially ever-failing world. <laughs> 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 um, should we open up to questions from the audience if we have no ti well, little time? If there is any, yeah. I have one question. Maybe to uh, Penny. To Penny and maybe also to Jan. Uh, and I would like to know about your ideas about like kind of strategies of actually implementing your alternatives. Like how do we actually get the legacy institution to give up some of their powers and to free some of their resources? Do we have to force them to particularly like kind of the private ones, the blue chip galleries you mentioned? How do you how do we make them pitch in money into the DAO? You talk to them. It's a very, very simple and tried and tested <laughs> mechanism. We opened up conversations. We set about the reasons. We told them we wanted to do it together rather than against them. And many people came forward and were willing to open up that opportunity. And I think, you know, I probably fail the anarcho younger self of myself uh, in doing that, but I do feel that there is some allies, you know, across the wall, so to speak. And I think it's about finding those allies and getting them in the right room uh, with you, uh, rather than kind of staging this us and them dichotomy, which I think can also leak out more broadly to how we live fundamentally. Um, but I think that there's also a strong restructuring and abolition of specific principles and ideas that you know the art world is going through. And I think that's probably also due to the fact that artists today, they come from quite different spaces. There is a heightened idea of not only survival, because um, as Jan said, many artists live in precarious situations, but there's also um, a new consensus, I think, about bringing in intersectional, uh, decolonialist, uh, rhetoric that has come from these younger artists, 
But I think at the same time, there's a lot of work that's been done within the arts that hasn't previously been done. So actually, the art market has kind of segued. Um, you have a lot of care work. You have a lot of reparation work happening in the arts. You have a lot of consultation work happening, especially within the technological field. I also work as a consultation um, to many companies um, in order to try to create different models of technology. Um, so I think, you know, the, the art world itself is changing and it's really about, I think, finding your allies in it. I think we have to close it for today, unfortunately, because we have another event coming up tonight and they have to rebuild the room. But I invite you all to come back on Tuesday where we have the next conversation between Elias Hirschel and Adrian Daub from California. And I want to thank you, this, this great panel. Thank you very much, Jan and Penny and Felix and Sarah. And thank you for coming today. Thank you.